Good morning, everyone. Welcome to El Shaddai. I'd like to welcome everyone as we get seated and get started this morning. Welcome those that are watching us and listening to us on the internet. And we just want to welcome everyone this morning and celebrate Shabbat. Pastor Mark is, is ready to teach us this morning on the Torah portion of Vayashlach. And uh, today, uh, just like to explain, I'm Tom O'Haver. I'm one of the, the pastoral elders here. Uh, pastor, Associate Pastor Art Palachak is actually in Israel right now, uh, along with uh, along with a couple other people, with his wife and and with Donovan and uh, his daughter and and Darlene are are planning on joining them soon. So they're in Israel right now. Pray that pray for them, and pray for the the land of Israel right now. They're going through a lot of turmoil. So just uh, remember them in prayer. So as we get started this morning, let's stand. And we're going to enter into prayer. Uh, Robert Straub's going to lead us in prayer this morning. Yahovah, Abba, we just love you. As we come together for the privilege of celebrating your Shabbat, have you revealed, as you have revealed to us the Hebrew roots, and the wonderful teaching from Pastor Mark and so many that are rediscovering as Christians the Hebrew roots. We're just so grateful that you've called us to be set apart. And what an honor and a privilege to serve you. And we pray that you soften the hearts of our brethren, the Hebrews around the world, and soften the hearts of the Christians that reject the Hebrew roots and those foundations that you've established. So we just pray you give us, each and every one of us, the humble heart of Moshe that led your people and may be we willing to love one another in a manner that is good and pleasing to you. May we bring joy to your heart and a smile upon your face as we worship you. In the name of our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. And I'm pretty sure Vyashlok is one of Mark's favorites. So here we go. I do love Vyashlok. <clears throat> Who do you see here? Jacob and Esau. This is the Torah portion. There is so much that is going on in this Torah portion. So what we're going to do today, we're going to kind of launch into one stream and then we're gonna go back to the beginning and launch into another stream and then go back to the beginning. We're just gonna keep going back and forth looking at all these different aspects. But right here, this is the, the word, va-yish-lach. And so this is the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, Genesis 32, three is the beginning verse of this Torah portion where it says, and Jacob sent and Vaishlak means, and he sent. So that's why this Torah portion is named that. And uh, Jacob is sending messengers before he comes to Esau's brother because he wants to find out uh, Esau's attitude. Okay, does Esau still want to kill me? In Genesis 27, the Torah portion prior, verse 43 through 45, here you have... Rebecca telling Jacob to run for your life. She says, now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him how long? A few days. Do you remember how long it actually he was gone? Yeah, 20 years. And she says, tarry with him a few days until my brother's until your brother's fury turn away, <clears throat> until your brother's anger turn away from you. And he forget that which you have done to him. Then she says, I will send and fetch you from there. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? So Rebecca says, okay, why don't you go run to my brother's house? After a few days, I'll send for you and fetch you. So as you recall last week, we had the story of Jacob's ladder where the angels are climbing up and down the ladder, telling him everything's gonna be fine. And now here we see in Genesis 28, 15, God says, behold, I'm with you. I'm going to keep you in all places where you go. I'll bring you again to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done that which I have spoken to you of. And so here's kind of some interesting things. 
you know, Rebecca's kind of saying, look, I'll never leave you. Even though you're going there, I'm with you. You know, and he's probably thinking, yeah, right. You know, I'm all alone. I'm running away from home, so to speak. And God is saying, well, don't worry. I'm going to be with you. Now, one of the interesting things I want you to note here, even though God is telling Jacob as he's fleeing the promised land that he's going to be with him, despite this promise of protection, God never tells Jacob when he was supposed to return, did he? He never said, okay, I'll come and get you after a few days when Esau's wrath is gone. You know, he's, he just says, look, I'm here to protect you. But he doesn't tell him how long it's going to be. And so 20 years pass, and Rebecca never sent for Jacob. So now if you're Jacob, and you're in this other land, you either think my mom and dad totally forgot about me, they don't care for me, or else my brother is still really mad. Okay? But my goodness, 20 years is a little bit more than a few days. Where's mom and dad? How come they haven't come and got me yet? So now, God is telling Esau it's time to go back. Well, does this, does this imply that Esau is no longer a threat? You know, in, in Jacob's mind, uh, he's thinking, well, good grief, it's been 20 years. Either mom and dad forgot about me, or Esau's still mad. So God, why in the world are you telling me to go back if Esau's still upset? You know, uh, Maybe God knew Esau wasn't upset anymore, even though mom didn't. Okay, well, here's another thought. Could it also be that God wanted Jacob to return knowing that Esau was still upset? Could it be that God wanted these two brothers to actually confront each other? Was God's purpose in sending the angelic messenger to struggle with Jacob all night? You remember the story? As he's coming back, he wrestles with the angel all night. Was it... Was the purpose of that angelic messenger to bless Jacob at this critical time? Or was it an attempt to stop Jacob's planned escape? Maybe Jacob really wanted to flee. He didn't want to go to the promised land and this angel is wrestling with him so he doesn't take off again. Well, let's take a look at some of these things. I think it's interesting in Genesis 32, 31, where it talks about the angel wrestling with him, it says, and as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. If you remember last week, I said the sun was setting as he was leaving. Now the sun is rising as he's coming back. And this angelic messenger has been wrestling with him all night long. And he says, let me go for the sun is rising. Well, when the sun rises, what is the first thing he sees? But Esau. It says in 33, one, Jacob lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, here comes Esau with his 400 men. So it's almost like this angelic messenger was trying to keep Jacob from fleeing in the middle of the night. He wrestles him to the light of day and the first thing he takes off and what does he see? Esau coming. Now I'm gonna <clears throat> do a little side trip here for a minute. And this is kind of the little trivia things I like doing. It's, the answers are in the Torah portion and different things that we're gonna be looking at. But first off, who killed King Saul? Does anyone remember who killed King Saul? Okay, Leader Ray, is that you? You are exactly right. Let's take a look here. But here's, an, but here's what, something else. Do you remember in this Torah portion, you have Simeon and Levi attacking all the Shechemites for what they did to their sister Dinah? How old do you think Simeon and Levi were when this event happened, that they would be able to kill all the men of the whole city? How old do you think they were? How old do you think Dinah was when this event happened to Dinah? Well, let's take a look at some things here. First off, this week's Torah portion introduces us to Amalek. Do you remember Amalek? In Genesis 36, 12, it says, Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. So what do we see? Amalek was Esau's grandson, right? <clears throat> well, now here's something. Let's take a look at this next clip. This is quite fascinating. First off, Amalek was Esau's grandson, right? Well, do you know that Jacob's grandson was Peretz because Judah gave birth to Peretz. So at the same time, you have Am Amalek come who wants to destroy the Jewish people. You have Peretz comes who's the forerunner of the Messiah. Very fascinating. But let's look at something else here. 
in Genesis 14, 7, it says, and they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites. So what do we see here? In, we just read Genesis 36, 12. This is the word Amalek. And that's what we just read, Genesis 36, 12. And she gave birth to Amalek. So if this is when Amalek is born in Genesis 36, 12, how come 400 years earlier it talks about the Amalekites in Genesis 14, 7? This is a prophecy. Just like Cyrus, it was prophesied that he would be born before he was born. Just like Josiah, it was prophesied he was going to be born before he was born. Here you have 400 years before Amalek was even born, you have Amalek mentioned in Genesis 14, 7. Now, you know what's fascinating about this? <clears throat> Here is the word Amalek. Here's the word Amalek. This is the first letter, the ayin. This is the last letter, the kuf. Well, do you know, if you begin with this first letter mention of Amalek in Genesis 14, 7, and you count every single Hebrew letter till you get to this letter kuf, you have 12,110 Hebrew letters. Now, who was a famous Amalekite that wanted to kill all the Jews? Haman. And what book do we find about Haman? What book is that in? Esther and the book of Purim. Well, guess what? That is the exact number of letters in the entire book of Esther. Just a little trivia thing that I find kind of interesting. <clears throat> now, what do we find in Exodus 17, 14 concerning Amalek? It says, the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. In other words, he doesn't want anyone to ever remember Amalek. As a matter of fact, look at Amalek's response in Psalms 83, 4. If you read the rest of Psalms 83, Amalek is mentioned. It says, Amalek is one of the, some of the other nations that say, they have said, come, let us cut Israel off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. So God says, I want Amalek to be no more in remembrance. And Amalek says, fine, I want Israel to be no more in remembrance. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 2, in the first part of verse 3, here the Lord comes to King Saul and he said, I remember what Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. I want you to go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and don't spare them. So here Saul was given the command to go kill all the Amalekites. And as you know, he spared them. And lo and behold, what do we find in 2 Samuel 1, 5 through 10? Saul has died. A young man is running up to David and tells him, and David says to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? And the young man who told him said, as I happened to be upon Mount Geboa, yeah, right, just happened. Don't you think if he's an Amalekite, he's kind of upset at Saul killing most all of his family? Don't you think he has a little bit of a grudge here? He just happens to be on Mount Geboa where the enemy is attacking Saul. But he says, as I happened to be upon Mount Geboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear and lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me. Yeah, what do you think he was doing behind Saul? How about chasing him? <clears throat> and he said, who are you? And I answered him, I am what? I'm an Amalekite. And he said to me again, please stand over me and kill me for anguish has come upon me because all my life is still in me. And I stood over him and killed him because I was sure he couldn't have lived after he had fallen. And David ended up killing this young man. But I think it's interesting how not doing what God told him to do, it was the very thing that ended up to be his undoing. Now let's make another little transition. Last week in Genesis 31, 19 was a story of Jacob with his wives and kids taking off from Laban. He's on the run from Laban. I mean, Jacob seems to always be a man on the run. He's running one direction or he's running another direction. And he's on his way to the promised land. And Laban had gone to shear his sheep. And his wife, Rachel, steals the idols that belong to her dad. And she's packing these images and these idols with them on the trip. 
And so what do we find in Genesis 35, 1 through 3? Now, if you remember last week, too, I told you that Jacob did something different that Abraham and Isaac didn't do. He didn't build an altar, okay? And here, in Genesis 35, 1 through 3, God says to Jacob, I want you to rise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar to God that appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And so Jacob says to his household and all that were with him, get rid of the idols. Get rid of all the strange gods that are among you and be clean, change your garments and let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. So here's something I want to mention to you. In the Torah portion, Jacob is returning to the covenant land. Well, our Haftor portion for today, the book of Hosea, it's all about Israel committing adultery through idolatry and the need to return to God and return to Torah. So there's a parallel in the Haftor portion. God is saying to Jacob, get rid of all your idols. You know, you need to return to the covenant. And uh, here in the Haftorah, Hosea is telling Israel they've committed spiritual adultery through idolatry and they need to return to God and to Torah. In Hosea 4, 6 is where God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Notice he does not say the heathen are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they've rejected knowledge, I'll reject you. You'll be no priest to me seeing you've forgotten the Torah. Wow. And so that puts a real big emphasis on how we don't want to forget Torah. In Hosea 8, 8 through 12, it talks mostly about Ephraim. And Ephraim, not Judah, but Ephraim is the one who's forgotten Torah. It says, Israel swallowed up. Now they'll be among the Gentiles as a vessel where it is no pleasure. They've gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Ephraim has hired lovers. Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them and they will sorrow a little for the burden of the king of princes. Now look at this. It says, because Ephraim has made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. And then look what God says. I have written to Ephraim the great things of my Torah, but they're counted as a strange thing. And that's still true today. Hosea 11:9, which is part of our Torah portion, God in his mercy says, I'm not going to execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim because I am God and not man. Thank goodness for that. Amen. And then what does he say in Hosea 14, 4 through 8? He goes on to say this. I'm going to heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. My anger's turned away from him. I'll be as the dew unto Israel. He'll grow as the lily. He'll cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches will spread. His beauty will be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under a shadow will return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof will be as the wine of Lebanon. And then finally, what is Ephraim going to say? What in the world do I have to do anymore with idols? So finally, Ephraim's going to get it. I need to get rid of all this idolatry. I need to return to Torah. Doesn't that sound like today? So let's go back to Genesis 32, 1 through 3, the beginning of our Torah portion. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. So think about this. Here, 20 years earlier, the angels of God, he sees them climbing up and down on this ladder as he leaves. Now he's coming back, and again he sees all these angels 20 years later. And what did Jacob say? He said, this is God's army. And he called the name of that place Machanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, to the land of Seir, the country of Edom. What that word Mahanaim means is double camp. In other words, two, two armies or two camps. All right. Well, I think it's interesting. God is telling Israel to return to Israel because Jacob's name is Israel, right? He's telling Israel, you need to return to Israel get rid of all the idols, and he sees two armies, basically. It's a double camp, his army and the angelic army. Well, in Song of Solomon, what do we see in chapter 6, verse 13? The whole concept of teshuva, or repenting and returning. And twice it says, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. And she says, what are you going to see in me? As it were, the company of what? 
two armies, this double camp. Here you in Solomon, you have this concept of the double camp, the two armies, the same thing that you see with Israel as they're returning back to the promised land, as they're returning back to Torah, as they're returning back to God. It's again, the bride and the bridegroom calling her back. Now in Genesis 31, 13, God is speaking to Jacob and he says, I am the God of Beth El, the house of God, Bethel. You know, the one where you anointed the pillar, where you vowed a vow to me. Now arise, get out from this land and do what? Return to the land of your kindred. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your kindred. So again, you see this concept of return, return. We see it in Hosea, we see it in Genesis, we see it in the Song of Solomon. Well, I think this is also prophetic of Israel in these very last days. Why do I say that? In Genesis 31, 41, we saw that Israel was 20 years out of the land. And prophetically, we also know Israel was out of the promised land for 2,000 years. And now they must wrestle with Yeshua before the final ingathering can be completed, just like he had to wrestle with the angel. <clears throat> One of the other half tour portions is from Obadiah, because you're going to see how it is tied to Esau and to Edom. In chapter 1, look at verse 10 through 15. Here we saw how Esau, through Amalek, his whole idea is to put Israel's name out of remembrance. But think about it. Esau and Jacob are supposed to be brothers, twins, as a matter of fact. And look at Obadiah 1, 10 through 15. God says, because of your violence against your brother Jacob, shame will cover you. You'll be cut off forever. And the day you stood on the other side, this is referring to the Babylonian captivity, when Nebuchadnezzar was coming and he's destroying all of the Jews and killing them and kidnapping them, taking them. And what did his brother do? His brother stood on the other side while all this is going on. He says, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, foreigners entered his gates, they cast lots upon Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. So God knew his heart. He says, but you should not have looked on the day of your brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. How often do we see that? People rejoicing when another people group are destroyed. Neither should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. You should not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. In other words, let's go get the spoils. Neither should you, now look at this, this is the worst one of all. Neither should you have stood in the crossway to cut off those that did escape. They were blocking the people's escape. Neither should you have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. They were turning them in. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. And here we get that famous verse. I don't know if you knew it came from here. But as you've done, it'll be done to you. Your reward will come upon your own head. I can't help but think of King Saul and the Amalekite. But this is what prophesied will happen in Obadiah 1, 17 and 18. It says, upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. There shall be holiness. The house of Jacob will possess their possessions. The house of Jacob will be a fire. The house of Joseph, a flame. And the house of Esau is going to be the stubble. And they'll kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. Wow. I mean, it's one of these things where you want to rejoice, but then it's like, oh, should I rejoice? You know, I mean, uh, I, I think what God is going to be instilling in a lot of us, uh, maybe even this next year, is, is a real sense of holy awe. I think a real sense of holy awe is coming with what is going to be happening in this world. Let me show you this next clip. <clears throat> Here's Jacob's journey. Here's something else. In Genesis 40, 31, 18, let's leave this up because I'm going to come right back to it. It says, he carried away all of his cattle and all of his goods, which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting, which he had gotten in Padanaram to go to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. Okay, so we have a couple things going on. How many of you know that every one of us do something for multiple reasons? Okay, we may have several reasons why we want to do something. And depending on who we're talking to, we'll tell that person why. And we may have a different reason to each person we're talking to. 
You know what I'm talking about? I know you do know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> well, here, God told Jacob, I want you to get back. And here it says Jacob wanted to go back, not only because God said, he wanted to also wanted to do what? He wanted to go see dad and mom. How long has it been? 20 years. He wants to go see Isaac. So he has another reason to come. But I want you to notice, here is Padanaran. Here's Haran. Here's where Jacob is. And now he's on his way back. And he comes right here to Penuel and the river Jabbok. And he wrestles, okay, with the angel and he crosses. How long does it take to get from here to here? How long do you think it takes? Well, let's look at, let's read the text here and it's going to tell us. In Genesis 31, 20 through 23, Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian and that he told him not that he fled. So he fled with all that he had. He rose up, passed over the river, set his face toward the Mount Gilead. And it was told Laban on the third day, Jacob was fled. So he took his brethren with him, pursued after him seven days journey and they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. So that means it's a seven day trip, at least when you're on a horse and you're running or a camel, whatever you're on from here to here. Do you see that? This is a seven day journey. So if from here to here is a seven day journey, how far, how long does it take to get from here to here? A couple of days, right? Keep that in mind. Okay. It's been 20 years since he's seen mom and dad. He's also has a vow that he has to go to Bethel, okay, and, uh, you know, build an altar to God, fulfill his vow. Which one do you think he's going to do first? Okay, he's here. Do you think he's going to, after he wrestles with the angel and Esau takes off again and all is good, do you think he's going to run over here to Bethel? Or do you think he's going to run down here to Hebron and see his daddy Isaac before he dies? What do you think he's going to do first? Well, that's Watch what happens. Okay. We are in, let's see where we're at. Okay. Genesis 33, 17. First off, it's only been a seven day journey. And so Jacob journeys to Sukkot, which is not even in the promised land. It's not even across the Jordan River. He's still right here. And what does he do? He builds a house and he makes booths for his cattle. Well, no, wait a minute. How long does that take? The sages say it was about a year and a half that he spent in Sukkot. Here he's supposedly in this big hurry to go see mom and dad. He's in this big hurry. God tells him to go to Bethel and build an altar. He stops just short of crossing over the promised land and he stops for a year and a half and builds a house and some booths for his cattle. What in the world is going on here? Okay, so now that he's done, well, first off, Sukkot is connected with the great ingathering of Israel into the promised land. But a year and a half goes by. So now, where do you think he's going to go? Okay, finally, he's crossing into the promised land. Is he going to go to Bethel, or is he going to go down to Hebron? Well, let's look what he does. Jacob left Laban after working for him for 20 years. Therefore, when he began his journey back, here's something else. We're going to do a little side trip here, too. Now, think of this. How long did Jacob have to work for Rachel? Seven years. But after that seven years, he got Leah instead. And so he had to work another seven years, right? Uh, okay, and then he stayed for like six, seven more years. So it was like 20 years before he came back. So think about this. It's been 20 years and he comes back, right? So how old is the oldest child, Reuben? Well, he had to wait seven years before he could even end up with Leah. It takes a year pregnancy. That's eight years. He left after 20 years. So he's 12 years old. The, does that, everyone following me with my math? Now he's been a year and a half in Sukkot. So Reuben is about 13 and a half. Reuben and, you know, Simeon and Levi, they're bar mitzvah boys. Okay. We're, we're talking the oldest is about 12 or 13, 13, 14. That's the oldest these kids are when they're going into the promised land finally. Now, look at this. Genesis 33, 18 and 20. So Jacob now, after that year and a half, when he's got these bar mitzvah boys, 
and younger kids, newborn. Joseph is probably a newborn. It says, he came to Salem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Padanaram and he pitched his tent before the city, he bought a parcel of field where he spread his tent and the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money, and he erected there an altar. Okay, so some of the people, if you go back to that map, supposedly he was supposed to go to Bethel or he was supposed to go to Hebron. He does neither. He goes to Shechem. Now, we might wonder, why in the world is he going to Shechem? He was spoke, God told him to go to Bethel and build the altar. He said he wanted to go see Isaac, okay, in Hebron, but he said he goes to Shechem. And how long was he in Shechem? Well, let's watch as things unfold here. Jacob left Laban after working, like I said, for 20 years. Therefore, when he began his journey back, his oldest child could not have been more than 13 years old. All right. Now, Dinah was his seventh child. So Dinah, at this time, could not have been more than six years old. <laughs> Look at this, because remember in Genesis 39, it says, when Leah saw she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob to wife. So it wasn't even, uh, you know, seven years. Totally. I mean, there had been a couple years. So at this time here, when you're looking at all this, she's, she's Dinah, when we're reading the story of Shechem at this time, is only around six years old. But wait till you see how this all unfolds when we get back. It's 1045. I was going to go to the end of the page, but we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up when we get back. But I just wanted to give you guys the time frame kind of get your interest into how all this is going to unfold. So let's stand and let's pray. Abba Father, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for your word. I pray, Lord, you truly would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, hearts to understand what you're trying to communicate to us, that we would be able to step back and get the bigger picture. Father, we just thank you for all the tithes and offerings that come in. We just pray that they would bless you, Father, and, uh, and allow us to continue to take your Torah to the nations. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. All right. Have you enjoyed that first half? And joining me is Chris Kuntz, who's going to pray. Um, so let's uh, stand up and ask God to open our hearts and our minds, hear what he has to say through his word, the second half. And here's Chris. Thank you, Peter. Wasn't this a wonderful tour portion, guys? Thank you, Pastor Mark, for bringing these beautiful things to us every week. Lord, we just thank you for this tour portion. We thank you for your word. We're so excited, Father, in this portion here with the, the, the new portion that we're going to be going into in John 1, also if, he, if Mark touches on it, where you reveal yourself, Father, to um, the people as you go and get baptized, and then you do your first miracle, and you reveal yourself to the people. Like I said, I ask God that today in your Torah, as we study, that you would reveal yourself to us in your Torah portion this week, and that we'd know you more and more. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen.
that you brought us in father we thank you and today father reign in us reign through us and we thank you for your servant today one whom you look down through the ages of time and know that this day he would be here today one whom you have trust giving him the ability the wisdom the knowledge and the understanding of your word we just thank you lord for him and for his wife and for all the elders for all the officers the different ones that you have given unto him to work together with him in this great ministry those that are across the world that are listening and hearing your word, his teaching, his instruction that you had given unto him, that there are others that are receiving the same teaching, the same instruction all over the world. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, because you are an international God. You are a worldwide God. You fill the whole creation, the heavens and the earth. You rule over all. You rule over the kings. You rule, O oh God, over the governors, the mayors, and you rule, O oh God, over all the kingdom of this earth. And so today, Father, we commit all in your hands. And you are moving by your spirit, Lord, and you're doing great things. You're, you're pulling down and you're building up, O oh Father. You're casting down because these are the words that you have said that you will do. You will shake everything that needs to be shaken. Keep on shaking, Lord. Almighty oh, God. You said, Lord, in your word that you will gather your people from the four wings of the earth and that you will establish them in the land that you have given them to their forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land that cannot be sold, a land that cannot be bought. And so we thank you that there is a people and there was somebody called Abraham and somebody called Isaac, somebody called Jacob and the 12 tribe of Israel that are scattered in the nation, Lord. Bring them home, almighty God, because you honor your word, oh God. We thank you because you said uh, if the moon refused to shine and the sun and the star refused to shine, then there wouldn't be a nation that is called Israel. But the sun is shining and the moon and the stars are shining. And therefore, there is a people that are called by your name, Israel. So, Father, we thank you today that through them, Almighty Father, we have your word, the Torah. Because of them, Lord, who have honored your word, Almighty Father, they hold fast to your truth because there is only one Yahweh. There is only one Elohim, Father. And because you are the rock, of our salvation because you are the mighty God you are the Holy One of Israel our Redeemer we thank you father we thank you today Lord because of whom you have chosen Almighty Father that you have chosen Moses you have brought your people to Mount Sinai where you gave the Torah oh father we just thank you today so bless your people Israel bless this congregation father Blessed, oh God, all across the universe today, in every nation, oh mighty Father. And we pray today that you will heal your people, Father, because you said you send your word and heal them. And that by your stripes we are healed. 
Heal, Almighty Father, today in the midst of this congregation. Meet every need today, Father. You know the needs today. You know the hearts and the desire of your people today. Only you, Almighty Father, who knows the heart and the needs and the desire of your people. So honor your word today, Father. We ask you in the name of Yeshua. Heal today, Father. Let your anointing rest upon your people today. All over the world, Almighty Father, those that were unable to be here today, you know what the circumstances are. So we ask you, Father, to visit them today. Comfort their heart. Touch them, Almighty Father. The healing that they need in their body. Whatever it is today, the needs of God financially. Whatever it is today, Father, bless them today. And remember your word that you have spoken to David. And David said, I was young. He had became old. He had never seen the righteous forsaken. Not a seed begging for bread. And you honor your word, Almighty Father. Supply the needs today. And we thank you for this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, what we want to do right now is jump back into our Torah portion. Oh my goodness. Boy, so much going on. What about all the visitors? Okay, so who's here visiting for the first time today? If you'd raise your hand, we have a gift for you. Raise your hand if you're visiting here for the first time. We'll give them a big hand. Okay, keep it up so the ushers can find you. And would you tell us where you're from? Where, let me come down here where I can see. The lights are in my eyes up there. Okay, who's here visiting? Right there, where are you from? What city or state or? Tacoma. Tacoma, all right. All right, and over here, where are you from? Down the street. <laughs> Tacoma, really close. Anyone else? Okay, yes. Auburn, all right. And over here? Shreveport, Louisiana. I think that's going to win the farthest prize. He gets the one that's come the farthest. Anyone else? All right. Well, it looks like that's it for today. Yes, yeah, Shreveport is the winner for who's come the farthest. Thank you. Well, it's so fun having visitors here all the time. Uh, what a blessing. And again, thanks to all the people that come on the internet. Uh, you're really a blessing. Uh, and I know many of you feel like you're a part of our family, and I want you to know you are. Okay, now, Genesis chapter 34, 1 through 3, it talks about Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which he bore to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land, and when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, lay with her, defiled her, and his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spoke kindly unto the damsel. Well, uh, it seems from the Torah's description of the incident with Dinah and Shechem, it appears that Simeon and Levi and the rest of their brothers must have been at least in their late teens, you would be thinking, not 12 and 13. You would think they'd be 19, 20, 21 at a minimum. I mean, some people may have thought they were in their 30s or 40s or 80s, but no, this happened at a very young age. But here's what we're going to find out. Um, not only that, they went to war against an entire city of all these men. You don't see little 12 and 13 year old boys able to do that. But let's take a look at Genesis 34, 25 and 26. Let's begin to look at the rest of the story. Uh, here's where it talked about how it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took each man his sword, came upon the city boldly, slew all the males. They slew Hamor, Shechem his son with the edge of the sword, took Dinah out of his house and went out. So the incident at Shechem more than likely took place about five years later when Simeon and Levi were probably closer to 19 and 20 and Dinah was around 13 or 14. And I'm going to show you why this is. Um, first off, why do you think Jacob, if his goal was to go to Bethel and build an altar and go to Hebron to visit his dad Isaac, would wait five years. 
okay? There's no way he would have waited five years. So let's watch how the story unfolds because you know he would have first returned to Bethel and then visit his elderly parents. The key is another verse. Oftentimes when things don't seem to make sense, these two verses, you look for a third verse that ties things together. And I don't know how many of you ever read the book of Jeremiah, for example. The book of Jeremiah, if you read it, it is totally not in chronological order. It's like someone tore every chapter of the book, put them in a bag, shuffled them up, threw them in the air, and how they ever they landed is how they wrote the book of Jeremiah. It is totally out of chronological order. Uh, I might end up teaching that this next year. But it, it is completely out of chronological order. So you can't read the Bible in chronological order, and you're going to find this incident in Shechem was not written in chronological order. What do we see in Genesis 48, 7? Here's this key verse. What does Jacob say when he came out of Padanaram? He says, as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, and yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. If he had waited five years, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have said, I came from Padan. He'd have said, I came from Shechem. So the fact that he says he came from Padan tells you more than likely what happened. He went to Sukkot, he went to Shechem, bought the parcel of land, then went to Bethel and offered to God, then went to Bethlehem on the way to see Isaac. Rachel dies, he sees Isaac. If you remember many years later when Joseph is 17, he's in Hebron and he sends his brothers up to Shechem to watch the sheep and that's where Joseph goes to. He had bought the land earlier, but he had gone down. Uh, he had fulfilled his obligation to God at Bethel. He saw mom and dad. He probably lived there for around five years. And then he goes back to Shechem when this incident happens. And what they're doing in the Torah, just recording the Shechem incidences together. What do we see here in Genesis 35, 27 through 29? Uh, Jacob came to Isaac, his father, and to Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And all the days of Isaac, it says, were 180 years. Isaac gave up the ghost and died, was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And then Esau and Jacob have reconciled at least to the point where they could bury their dad together. In verse, uh, Genesis 32, verse 28, let's go back now again to the wrestling with the angel. Here is the story of where he's, the Bible calls him an angel. It also calls him a man. So who is this? Some people say it was Esau's angel. Uh, some say it was just an angel. Some said it was a man. Well, I think it was Yeshua. And let's take a look at what this says. It says, uh, after the wrestling in Genesis 32, 28, he said, your name will no more be Jacob, but Israel for as a prince, have you had power with God and with man and have prevailed. Let's go into the next verse, Genesis 32, 30. Look what Jacob says. He calls the name of the place Peniel. Panah is face, El is God. And he calls it Peniel because he says, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So this is why I believe he wrestled with Yeshua. In Ezekiel 20, 34 through 35, again, we have to remember, think of things circular, history repeating itself. Look what happens with Israel. Remember I told you earlier how the 20 years was representative of 2,000 years and Israel's gonna have to wrestle with Yeshua again? In Ezekiel 20, 34 and 35, God says, I'm gonna bring you out from the people. I'm gonna gather you out of the countries where you're scattered with a mighty hand, with a stressed out arm, with fury poured out. And I'm gonna bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face. This is something that has not happened yet. Okay, Genesis 32, six through nine. Here are the messengers returned to Jacob and they said, well, we came to your brother Esau and he's coming to meet you with 400 soldiers. And so Jacob was greatly afraid, he's distressed. So what did he do? And this is prophetic, I believe, of today as well. And you're gonna see this. He, in one sense, he's preparing for war. He's also praying to God and he's also trying to appease Esau. And sometimes today, Jacob has the role of appeasing the enemy. Sometimes Israel prays, and sometimes Israel prepares for war. 
and they seem to go back and forth and back and forth. What's interesting, well, I don't have time to go into all of this, but God changed Abraham and Sarah's name by adding the letter Hey from his name, from the Yehovah. He didn't change their whole name. He just added a letter to each of their names. Isaac, he didn't change his name because God told Abraham, this is what his name's going to be. Okay. But Jacob was given his name by his parents. And so God came and changed his name, but he didn't just change his, a few letters. He completely changed his name. Okay. But what's interesting is when Abram's name is changed to Abraham, he's always called Abraham. But Jacob in the Bible keeps bouncing back and forth between Jacob and Israel, Jacob and Israel, Jacob and Israel. And I think it's because the Israel meant, means basically to have power with God, you know, like an army, a strong force. Jacob is more appease, appease, appease. Run for your life, run for your life. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. Well, that's because Israel is still doing today. Israel is still caught between do we appease, do we fight, you know, uh, do we pray? And so I think it's very interesting. But what do we find here? He says, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people that were with him, the flocks, the herds, the camels into two bands. And he said, okay, if Esau comes to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord, you're the one that told me to return. <laughs> Would you please talk to me concerning Esau? I mean, if Jacob, if anything, I mean, you know, God loved Jacob. Here, Jacob is crying out to God, will you please answer my prayer concerning my brother Esau? You told me to go back. Will you tell me if, he's gonna, if Esau is going to come and kill us all or not? I bet he felt like there was some unanswered prayer here. He, God never does answer him. He just says, go back. And so Yo, uh, Jacob first reminds God that it was his idea for him to return and that God did promise to protect him. He says, you know, he says, and Jacob said, oh, God of my father, Abraham, God of my father, Isaac, the Lord would said to me, return to your country and to your kindred. I will deal well with you. So he says, okay, if that's the case, tell me what's going on here. Maybe uh, he thought if Esau remains a danger, maybe after 20 years, mom hasn't come and told me. So Esau must be a danger. Maybe. And how many of you think this way too? It can't be God's fault. It has to be my fault. Maybe I've used up all my protection points. Okay, so what does God want him to do? He's asking God, what should I do? Esau's coming, you know. Uh, am I supposed to confront Esau? Should I appease him? Should I stand up and fight? Should he run away directly to the promised land? You know, should he hide his wife and children and then face Esau maybe by himself. So how many of us sometimes have all this turmoil going in our mind, all these events happening, we feel like this big major conflict is coming and we're pleading to God, what do you want me to do? Just speak to me. <clears throat> well, take a look at Genesis 32, 16 through 22. It says, he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves and said to his servants, okay, you pass over before me and put a space between, you know, each herd. And then he commanded the one at the front saying, okay, when Esau meets you and ask you, whose do these belong to and where are you going and whose are these before you? Then I want you to say, these are your servant Jacob's and it's a present sent to my Lord Esau and behold, he's right behind us. But guess what? He wasn't right behind him. Each group was supposed to say, oh, he's right behind us. And it says, for he said, I will what? Appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterward, I'll see his face. Maybe he'll accept me. And so it says when the present, uh, he so went the present over before him and he lodged that night in the company. He rose up that night, took his two wives, his two women servants, his 11 sons and passed over the Ford Jabbok. So off he goes. And then what does it say? It says he took them and he sent them over the brook and he sent over all that he had. And then here, Jacob, he's left all alone and that's when he wrestles this man until the breaking of the day. And that's when his, the hollow of his thigh gets uh, knocked out of joint as he wrestled with him. It makes you wonder if this guy is so strong that he can do that. Was he just kind of play wrestling all night with Jacob? I mean, it's like he said, let me go, let me go. Like he couldn't get away. And then he simply smacks him and it's all over with, game over, you know. 
And, and it kind of makes you, what was, what was the purpose? And again, could it have been he was trying to keep him from running away, from facing Jacob? How often do we want to run away from confrontation? I don't think anybody really enjoys it. In verse 27 through 29, now hey, this is what's key. It's a very fascinating. Jacob says, what is your name? Or the angel says to Jacob, what is your name? And he says, well, my name's Jacob. And he said, your name will no more be called Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince, have you had power with God and with men and you've prevailed? And so what does Jacob do? He turns around and says, all right, what's your name? And then the, the angelic messenger says, uh, why do you want to know my name? And so he blessed him there. Well, <clears throat> I think what's interesting is destiny is compelling Jacob to confront the enemy instead of always fleeing. He fled from Esau in Beersheba to go see Uncle Laban. He fled from Laban in the middle of the night. And now it's fight or flight with this angel who dislocates his hip. So he can't run anymore. He can't run from his problems anymore. He has to face them. But because he's finally going to face them, he receives a new name. In Genesis 33, 1 through 4, again, he looks up at the breaking of the day and he looked and here comes Esau. What is he going to do? He's got his 400 men with him. He's already divided uh, all the children. And he puts the handmaids and their children in the front. And Rachel and Joseph are at the back. And he passed over before them. And then what does he do when he sees Esau? He bows to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau runs to meet him. I can just see Esau running to meet him. And Jacob's running, wondering, is this going to be a nice run to meet me or not a nice run to meet me? And it says he embraced him, fell on his neck, and he kissed him, and they wept together. Well, you know what's an amazing thing about this? It's been in every Torah scroll for the last 3,500 years. When this is written in the Hebrew, you don't see this in the English. You only see this in the Hebrew text. Let's put this next clip up. Here's where it says, and kissed him. is right here in the Hebrew. And you notice it has all these little marks those are not vowel points. Those of you that know Hebrew know these are not vowel points. This is an anomaly. This is like one of the little jots and tittles that have been in the Bible. Where it says he kissed him, the sages say, they're trying to figure out what could that have meant. And they said that has to be teeth marks from the Esau's kiss into Jacob's neck. And they say symbolically what that means is that it was a hypocritical kiss. Okay, remember like Judas Iscariot, what did he do? He kissed Yeshua. And so in the text, so you don't see this in the English, but in the Hebrew, it has all those little, like little bite marks above the word, and he kissed him, implying, they say, that it was a very hypocritical kiss. And then in Genesis 35, 16 through 18, it talks about how they journeyed from Bethel, and they came to roughly Bethlehem. Rachel travailed, she had hard labor, and it came to pass when she was in hard labor, the midwife said to her, don't fear, you're going to have this son also. But it came to pass as her soul was departing, for she died that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Ben-Yamin. Okay, what does Ben-Oni mean? Son of my sorrow. And so I believe Ben-Oni prophetically speaks of his first coming of the Messiah, and then the name Benjamin, which is the son of my right hand, speaks of Messiah's second coming at the right hand of glory. Amen. Look at Psalms 110. Well, first Psalms 116, three and four. The sorrows of death hem me in, the pains of hell took hold on me, I found trouble and sorrow. But look at Psalms 110, one, the Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So I believe this is prophetic of Yeshua. And then we see in Genesis 35, 19, Rachel died and was buried in Bethlehem. Now, the other interesting thing is Genesis 29, 9, it says, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she was a shepherdess. Well, Rachel's name means a ewe lamb. So her name was a lamb and she took care of the lambs. But now think about this for a minute. Let's put this now in context. What is happening right now? Jacob's name is now what? Israel. And Rachel's name means what? Lamb, a female lamb, a ewe lamb. Okay. So at this moment, Israel is mourning the death of his lamb, bringing sorrow in Bethlehem. 
what does he do? He pitches his tent at the watchtower for the flocks where another precious lamb will be born that will comfort Jacob or Israel. So Jacob's distress over the death of Rachel was at the time of her distress in childbirth. So if you look at Matthew 2, 16 through 18, this is where we see Herod killed all the boys in Bethlehem, all right? And that comes from Jeremiah 31, 5. So Rachel's travail in childbirth hinted at the travail also of the birth of Messiah. Now let's take a look at these next clips here. I just want to show you this. How many of you have been to Rachel's tomb? Some of you have. I've been there. I just want to show you real quick how it looks over the years. This is, uh, I think, back in the 1800s. This was a drawing of what Rachel's tomb looked like. Here's a, in 1894, here's what it looked like. And then in the 1900s, it got improved. Kever Rachel, or the grave of Rachel. But here's what it looks like the last time I was there. We had to take an armored bus to go see it. We had to have a soldier on the bus to open up this, unlock this chain. He got back on the bus. And here's the, a watchtower with this 30 foot concrete wall. And here it is on both sides. So you don't get shot while you're trying to go visit Rachel's tomb in Bethlehem. And uh, here's another shot of it. It's got the Israeli flag and the, the watchtower. Uh, but anyway, I mean, it's kind of ridiculous how things have changed. But we're going to talk a little bit about the watchtower here. In our Torah portion, Genesis 35, 20 and 21. Here, Jacob sets a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. It says, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Adar, which means flocks, the tower of the flocks. So he pitched his tent at the watchtower for the flocks where another precious lamb will be born that will comfort Israel. Look at Micah 4, 8 and 9. It says, and you, O Migdal Adar, or tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto you shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like what? A woman in labor. So this is definitely hinting right back at Rachel. There's a Targum. These, are, these Targums are written in Aramaic. It's called Targum Yonatan. And it takes these two verses in Genesis 35 and Micah, and here's what it says. They, they paraphrased it to say this. He spread his tent beyond Migdal Ader, the place where King Messiah will reveal himself in the end of days. And I think that's so interesting when you realize Yeshua was born in Bethlehem. And we see in Micah 5, 2, it says, but you Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall he come forth to me that is to be a ruler in Israel. And look at this, whose goings forth have been from everlasting. This again is proving to you how Yeshua is both God and man. His goings forth have been forever. And we see in 1 Samuel 16, 1, we see how the Lord said to Samuel, how long are you gonna mourn for Saul, seeing I've rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, go, I'm sending you to Jesse, the where, the who? From where? Bethlehemite. For I provided myself a king among his sons, which is why Yeshua is the king of David. <clears throat> so here's an interesting comment. The messianic promise of a coming king, right here we just read in 1 Samuel 16, 1, God says, I'm gonna provide myself a king. So here we have the messianic promise of a coming king who's going to sit on the throne of David. And where is this given? Under the watchtower of the flock, the coming king was raised. And here, the spotless lamb destined for sacrifices were also born and raised. It was the lambs in Bethlehem that the Levitical shepherds would watch. They were the ones that weren't just for general eating. They were used specifically for the temple. And so we know that the big doll Ader was the watchtower that uh, was guarded that the temple flocks. And so the Levites are going to be the ones watching over them. It was the Levitical shepherds who kept them and were specifically trained to make sure they didn't have any spots or blemishes. And what do we see in Luke 2, 8? They were in the same country, shepherds living out in the flock, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
So here at the very same place, the Levitical shepherds are looking at the temple flocks at the same time Yeshua is born. So in Micah chapter 5, verse 3 through 5, we'll close with this verse. It says, therefore, he will abandon them until the time that she who is in labor gives birth. Then the rest of his brothers will return to the children of Israel. He'll stand and he will shepherd in the strength of Yahweh and the majesty of the name of Yahweh, his God. They will live for then he will be great to the ends of the earth and he will be our peace. Amen. So that's what we have to look forward to as the musicians come forward. Let's stand. What a closing prophecy that last verse is. It is just amazing to me. In Micah 5, 3 through 5. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah, for your word, and I pray, Lord, that even as uh, we go with this coming Hanukkah coming up, Father, we just pray truly for Israel's protection. Because I, I, I believe it's not going to be a time to appease anymore, but it's going to be a time to fight coming up. And so, Father, we just pray for their protection for all of your people. We pray for America's protection in all of this. Father, be with our troops. Be with their troops. Father, keep us in an attitude of prayer over this Hanukkah. It's all about not being assimilated. Father, help us to not be assimilated. But even as you said in your word, to flee from idolatry and and to cling on to you. Spirit, I just pray that you would touch our church, touch your body worldwide. Prepare us for the coming days. Father, we want to be ready. We want to be prepared. Father, we just pray for the the fall rains of your spirit to fall on everyone here. You love us so much. You want to call us your own. You want to bless us. You want to place your name upon us. We don't deserve it, but we thank you for it. You told Moses to tell Aaron to say this prayer over your people, and in so doing, you would bless them and place your name upon them. Ivarekka Adonai Vayishmarekka Ya'er Adonai, Panavileka, Vihuneka. Yisa Adonai, Panavileka, Viasem, Laka, Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Basham Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, go and be blessed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's pastormark at elshadiministries.us. Be blessed and shalom.